What's up, meta-nerds? This video is all about the core ships used by the CIS. This version of the core ship existed for over 100 years before the time of the Clone Wars, being used by the Nymoidians for trade across the galaxy. It's actually surprisingly tied to Nymoidian culture. Their species are known for being cutthroat in their ambition, with some biologists believing that this is instilled in them from the time as larval grubs, with their parents giving the hives a small amount of food. This caused the grubs to fight to the death for scraps, and this mentality was reinforced in their school system and up through adulthood. They developed these core ships around the layouts of their hives, with different levels being occupied by Nymoidians of different status. The executives and dignitaries would occupy these upper towers, being able to command the core ship from this bridge. As you move down the levels, you go through the lower rungs of Nymoidian society, with engineering decks, mechanics, and ending on janitors and droids. You would never see high-ranking Nymoidians walking around in these lower levels. Because the purpose of this ship is to transport goods across the galaxy, giving and receiving goods from various worlds, it has many loading bays and boarding tubes to accommodate many types of alien ships. For example, this is a docking ring that can accommodate Corellian ships of any size. Its interior space amounted to a cargo capacity of 66 million cubic meters, or 2.3 billion feet cubed. It is hard to compare that to other Star Wars ships since the stat that is usually given is just the weight, but for a real world comparison, let's look at the largest container vessel on Earth. You could fit about 85 OOCL Hong Kongs into a single core ship, which would come out to 1,820,000 of these 20 foot containers. And there are no stats for how many MTTs, AATs, and C9979s could fit inside of this thing, but just based on the raw space, you could fit 33,000 MTTs. But of course, that number would be a lot less, since they can't occupy every cubic inch, but keep in mind that they could be in stored inside of the C9979 landing craft. Speaking of which, this is a really cool shot where you can see how that ship is transported, where they take off those wide side wings. These would be assembled either in the Lucra Hulk, or in one of these hangar bays on the side, when it was time for some illegal planetary blockade action. This core ship would have to set down in specialized landing pits, with the feet extending out from the ball itself. Its thrust exits via a single massive exhaust, and at the bottom of this pit, there is a 4 mile deep hole, into which the liftoff thrust is harmlessly channeled away from the support structure. This is done with real world starships too, and they're even adding water for sound suppression, though of course on a much smaller scale. To help hold up all of this weight, it takes advantage of a series of massive repulsor lifts. The same tech that lets things float in the Star Wars universe can be used in massive cargo haulers in order to offset the effects of varying weight when the core ship goes in and out of different atmospheres and gravities. There are even gravitational reflectors that line the landing pit, which helps to increase this effect when the core ships are sitting down for long periods of time. If we move back inside of the ship, we can see the enormous reactor with fuel reserves encircling it on the bottom and then newer secondary fuel silos were located on the top levels to help address some overloading issues, and there are even these ancillary reactors located on different decks. Though these look like Imperial Star Destroyer shield generators, they are actually just massive balls of fuel. The shields are generated by a series of these cylinders located on the mid-levels. These shields are incredibly strong when inside of the pit, having extra shield cyclers that it draws on, but even when separated, it is strong enough to fend off turbolaser attacks from even capital ships. I know the first time we see one, it is being melted apart by SPHAs, but that just shows how powerful those walkers are. It was getting hit repeatedly by four SPHAs just laying into it, eventually cutting the fuel lines to the reactor, which of course cut off its thrusters. Remember, it was just a single SPHA laser retrofitted inside of the Venator's ventral hangar bay that was able to take out a munificent class frigate with a single hit. Of course, the core ship was much larger, at 696 meters or 2,283 feet across, meaning you could nearly stretch two munificents across it, and was more than 100 meters wider than the Venator. At 914 meters or 3,000 feet tall, it was about three and a half Venators high, or nearly a munificent stood end to end with a Zillow Beast standing on top. All of this required a pretty substantial crew, with 60 Trade Federation supervisors, 3,000 droid operators, and 200,000 maintenance droids that came to replace those lower level Nymoidian laborers. It could also transport 60,000 passengers, with most of these suites being very upscale to meet with potential trade clients. In order to ensure a great holonet connection, they have one of the best hyperwave transmitters money can buy, which is picked up by the transmitters in the main spire. These enormous dishes were added to control the droid army, and are the same sort that are found on the Lucre Hulk. 
Speaking of that enormous cargo hauler turned battleship carrier, after the Trade Federation's blockade of Naboo, the Republic forced them to disassemble the Lucre Hulk. But the Trade Federation was able to just detach the core. So they would dump the arms and main engine out in space, travel down to the planet's landing pit, and then just fly back out and reconnect with the body to become a Lucre Hulk. We don't have a figure for its top atmospheric speed, but we do get a 300G acceleration, which is one tenth that of the Benator. During the opening battle of the Clone Wars, we saw that one was shot down by SPHAs, but concurrent to this was a squad of elite clone commandos that were able to infiltrate a core ship, get the launch codes, and then block that signal to all other core ships. By grounding them on Geonosis, this deprived the enemy of a substantial amount of CIS assets right at the beginning of the war. Later core ships were modified, taking it up from 280 point defense laser cannons to 21 quad point defense laser batteries, 48 assault laser cannons, and 3 turbo lasers. But then there were certain variants that had even more turbo lasers added, and dedicated their entire cargo capacity to starfighters. Two of these models were seen during the Battle of Rendili, where they were able to hold off a pair of Acclimator class assault ships. It wasn't until a third Acclimator and five Dreadnought class cruisers arrived that these core ships were finally destroyed. Then there were also some variants like Skytop Station, which changed it inside and out to be an enormous listening post. This thing was headed by a crew of expert slicers from the Hyper Communications Cartel. With their expertise in this amazing piece of technology, they could both encrypt CIS transmissions and hack into Republic transmissions sent via Hyperwave and on the Holonet. Another modified core ship was the Unlimited project found on Utapau. This had a ton of listening equipment as well, but also added a variety of landing pads and staging areas, while also operating as a meeting place for CIS leadership. After the Clone Wars ended, unlike most CIS assets that were just destroyed or incorporated into the Imperial military, some core ships were sold off to the Corporate Sector Authority, one of the few places in the galaxy that retained its autonomy under the Empire. As far as I could find in all the sources on the Holonet, it appears that this is the final resting place for this century-old line of Nymoidian transports. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. It appeared in a ton of video games, not limited to Jedi Starfighter, Battlefronts both old and new, and it was in the comics Republic 67 through 72. It was also in a ton of different novels. And the stats come from the Star Wars Complete Cross Sections and New Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels. So that's it for the core ship. If you want to connect with us, help support this channel, or get your own copies of the reference material used to make this video, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, the core ship ain't weak, it's just that the SPHA's a beast. And the Force will be with you, always.